Um, demographic, economic and social factors in the evolution of Finnish fertility 1722 to 1978. This is the title of Wolfgang's dissertation dated 18, uh, 1983. It was a study on fertility in Finland from a historical perspective. The careful reader detects a strong connection to his personal family. Wolfgang, uh, Wolfgang's wife is from Finland and his father, Heinrich Lutz, was an historian. With other words, Wolfgang started his scientific career with research on fertility in a family context. Whereas the birth of a child is one of the most emotional moments in the life of parents, demographers use a technical term transition from parity zero to parity one, and transition from parity two to parity three, and so forth. And whereas having another child depends very much on the number of children that you already have and on the sleepless nights that you experienced, <laughs> demographers use the technical term parity-specific fertility for this. Very early in his scientific career, in 1984 and 1985, Wolfgang studied parity-specific fertility. And this already in a broad perspective. He did not focus on Austria or on a specific, very beautiful Nordic country, but analyzed at that time 128 countries in a comparative perspective. So from the very beginning of his scientific career, he had a global vision, not looking on Austria or Europe, but on the whole world. Today's morning session is on fertility and family dynamics. And three distinguished scholars, Thomas Sobotka, Maria Rita Testa, and Francesca Pillary, are going to share their insights with us. Two of them, Thomas and Maria Rita, are part of Wittgenstein, and contributed to the high reputation of Wittgenstein in the realm of fertility. With Francesco Billary, professor currently at, uh, of sociology uh, and demography at the University of Oxford, the VAD has long-standing connections and collaborations, and Francesco is part of our scientific um, advisory board, and we are glad to have him here as a speaker. I now ask Thomas Sobotka, to download his presentation <laughs> <laughs> and start with his talk on fertility and migration. Good morning, it's, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this celebration and part of this, part of this conference here. Uh, today I will speak about one of Wolfgang's favorite topics uh, on optimal fertility. And, well, Wolfgang is never shy uh, of delving into very difficult and tricky topics, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, you have already heard about uh, the amazing range of topics Wolfgang has been researching yesterday and uh, also today in the morning session with Richard. And uh, it's really amazing to see that uh, his research includes, well, anything connected to education and population, but also any projections of any kinds of population composition or in any year through 2300 or things like, as you heard yesterday from Jesus, uh, predicting the future spread of democracy in Iran. So Wolfgang has this wonderful ability to think out of the box, connect really different pieces of evidence. Uh, 
start new research which either no one has considered doing before or no one has dared doing before. And uh, he also sometimes likes to go against some of the ingrained conventional views of the profession. Now in the area of fertility I would love to mention three uh, of such areas of research Wolfgang has uh, left uh, his imprint on. One is uh, the theory of the low fertility trap developed by this together with Vegard Schirbeck and Maria Rita Testa. Uh, the other is a very different kind of contribution which relates also to Wolfgang's interest in population environment interactions uh, is the study on population density as a factor in declining human fertility, also with Maria Rita Testa and Dustin Penn. And the third, which I will spend most of the time talking about today, is the topic of optimal fertility, most of which Wolfgang researched together with Erich Triesnik. And this is one of the topics that uh, if, if someone would suggest it to me, I would say no, this is, this is no way, it's so subjective and, and so difficult to define. Uh, the reviewers would kill such a paper and, and uh, I, I would probably never dare uh, doing such a research, but uh, Wolfgang is never hindered by such considerations. So he very bravely uh, tries his best uh, and uh, deal with, with the topic in a very scientific and systematic way. The underlying idea um, is that the long-term population equilibrium and the underlying concept of replacement level fertility might not be the optimal outcomes uh, in many populations. And uh, now I cite from Erich and Wolfgang's paper, uh, they, they state that they go against, they state correctly, they go against wide, widespread beliefs and they claim that it is far from self-evident that replacement level fertility should be considered the most desirable, desirable level of fertility for any given society. Uh, the idea was slowly germinating already in previous research by Wolfgang some years back. So in a paper with Warren Sanderson and Brian O'Neill, um, they suggested that in their population balance model of, of future uh, global population change, uh, which took sustainable development into account and population growth in, into the account, so they already discussed the idea, and they suggested that improved population, uh, improved education, sorry, may lead to productivity gains uh, in the population, uh, and it may also imply higher costs associated with, with achieving higher education, which may shift the optimal fertility to lower than the replacement level, and they speculated about the range somewhere between 1.4 and 1.7 uh, as possible optimal fertility. Now I discuss a little bit more about the concept and main criteria and key arguments uh, Wolfgang and Eric and some of the co-authors have been discussing uh, in the framework of optimal fertility. Uh, in fact, the topic has hardly ever been debated before Wolfgang got at it, and um, there was clearly uh, this overwhelming sort of concept of replacement level fertility was, was really clearly the dominant concept in, in thinking about what could be the best fertility level in a society. And uh, this was related, of course, to, to either the idea of population uh, reaching a stationary state with, with fi either fixed size or fixed age distribution or achieving long-term equilibrium between fertility and mortality. And this has been really deeply ingrained in demographic thinking. Uh, any criteria of optimality, what could be optimal and optimal fertility um, are very tricky. Uh, you can think of different spatial population levels um, different considerations. Are we thinking about global level? Are we thinking about individual countries, regions, ethnic groups or nations, um, or even individuals or their families? And, and different perspective you take, you may come up with very different uh, outcome of what the optimal fertility might be. 
There are also many very different rationales uh, related to optimal fertility. You may think of environmental sustainability, you may think of economic prosperity, productivity, well-being of the population, uh, having enough labor force in the labor market, you can think of reducing the pace of population aging. Uh, of course, the conventional thinking is very much related to military strength. And there are a lot of uh, feelings about national, ethnic, religious or culture identities. So Wolfgang and Sergei, in a paper in 2008, clearly distinguished between population and individual level replacement. Uh, and they somehow suggest that uh, in these discussions they leave individual level replacement aside because that's also quite difficult to define and they tackle the issue of optimal fertility from a population-wide perspective. And then Eric and Wolfgang uh, have a take on these issues in three different papers and in these papers they focus especially on European context. They relate their research to the current European debates about shrinking labor force, about old age dependencies, population decline, and sometimes you can uh, hear in these discussions about runaway pace of population aging. Uh, they also refer uh, to the earlier findings in Wolfgang's paper with Brian O'Neill and Sergei Sherbov that European population have reached negative population momentum somewhere around the year 2000. So even reaching replacement level fertility uh, in the absence of migration, of course, would not guarantee that European population would stabilize in a short, short term. It wouldn't stabilize for many decades, actually. Uh, and also, uh, their research very nicely relates uh, to new efforts of pronatalist or explicitly pronatalist policies in some parts of Europe, but also outside Europe, where policymakers are still very rigidly focused on boosting fertility rates, uh, being informed by this old idea of replacement level fertility as being the best target they should aim to achieve. Uh, Wolfgang and Eric quite clearly define their analytical focus when looking at optimal fertility. So they think about economic and social security consequences of population aging and in their latest paper in 2014 in demographic research they also add environmental aspects to their discussion. And of course, be it Wolfgang, they very strongly take education into the center of, of their discussion of optimal fertility. So what they do is, uh, in a very brief way, in a nutshell, that they try to achieve the lowest level of education-weighted dependency ratios. And they look at what levels of fertility are related to achieving the lowest levels of these education-weighted population ratios in the future. Now, the interesting thing is that while Wolfgang personally achieved the most conventional family size ideal around, um, he loves to argue that optimal fertility could be lower than that. Uh, even uh, he, he did discuss a little bit on individual level um, optimal fertility and in one paper with Sergey, uh, he suggested that actually it's sufficient to have just one child uh, per couple is if the primary goal is to just to pass one's genes and so that they continue living into the next generations. Now, turning to population level optimal fertility, uh, they suggest that improved education of the smaller, younger cohorts may counterbalance the negative effects of rising dependency ratios in aging populations. And as a result, of replacement fertility can be optimal if society is willing to spend more and more on each of the child's education. So what's the optimal level of fertility for the next decades? And as usual, Wolfgang is very modest about the time horizon of his projections. He says we are just concerned about 21st century. Well, maybe a little bit beyond that, but not much. And the argument is, 
Well, let's, let's leave the task of looking into the consequences that go beyond the 21st century into, the, into our great-grandchildren, who should then figure out for themselves what, what optimal fertility can be one century from now, based on technological progress and, and uh, on the ways how society develops in the future. But actually, um, when you look at the picture, they go slightly beyond 22nd century, so the figure, many of the figures they show end up somewhere around 2150, so that's, that's the kind of time horizon. And the really amazing thing there is, uh, I think that's, that's the first ever research uh, which would suggest that at any period we are considering the optimal fertility may be zero for human population size. So if you, uh, for, for human population. So if you think about minimizing education weighted support ratios for the year 2040 or for the year 2050, the most optimal fertility for that to achieve is zero because you do not have to spend money on educating the young kids who are being born now and 10 years from now, and you can still reap the benefits of, of past education investments of the cohorts who will be turning 20 or 30 or 40 at these periods of time and becoming very productive on the labor market. Of course, what matters in the very long perspective is not what we should look for the next few decades, uh, we should perhaps look at what's the optimal fertility from the time horizon of looking at 2100 or something like that. And then this illustration for EU27 and China, of course based on the assumptions Wolfgang and Eric have in their papers, suggest that European optimal fertility is, well, somewhere <coughs> around 1.7 and Chinese optimal fertility is even lower. But uh, let's go a little bit deeper into some of these assumptions later. Now I throw another topic into this consideration and I would like to discuss a little bit on migration now. So when we think of bringing migration into the picture of population replacement, things also change quite a bit from the conventional view that population replacement fertility should be 2.1. And Wolfgang and Eric have discussed a little bit about that. They said, well, for now we leave international migration out of the picture because it would only complicate our computations. But they speculate rightly that optimal fertility would be yet lower if migration is taken into account. Now, there has been quite a bit of interest in how migration is reshaping populations since the early 2000s, uh, where the, when there was in 2001, a UN paper, a bit controversial in its conclusions and computations on replacement level migration. And since then, uh, quite a number of papers have discussed different concepts uh, and methods, how to analyze this. Now, the emerging consensus is that migration matters quite a lot, but there is overall quite little clarity about how anything like replacement level migration can be measured. And because time is short, I take just one of these concepts uh, into consideration here and I try to illustrate how it can be used and combined with the analysis of optimal fertility rates. So actually, there are two broad approaches on how one can look at intergenerational replacement in the presence of migration. One is that you think about birth replacement. You think that the numbers of births born today should roughly uh, be compared to the numbers of births born in the same country one generation ago. And what contributes to the numbers of births born today, of course, are also all these migrants coming to the country in the past decades or leaving the country in the past decades. They contribute to the, to the depletion of the numbers of births. A different concept is that you don't care about where people are born. You just care that they come to the country at a certain point of time. So it's a concept of population replacement, which is not focused on biological re reproduction, but on how cohorts <coughs> replace themselves. And you can think, that's my favorite way of doing that, you can think of looking, for instance, at women in prime reproductive and productive age, age 30, now living in Austria. And 
relate their number to the number of their mother's generation at the time they were born. This is in a very nutshell the idea of behind the indicator I'm using. And just to illustrate something which Richard did for Wolfgang's birth cohort, so I do it for the birth cohort of 1974, and I look only at women uh, to illustrate how the cohorts are changing through migration. In 1974, there were 47,000 women born in Austria, and at that year, the net reproduction rate was 0 0.96. If you would take life tables from human mortality database, this population would shrink by 3.2% by reaching the age of 40. So here I use age 40, not 30 for this illustration. Now try to guess what's the actual change of Austrian population instead of minus 3%. Well, to make it short, it's plus 22%. So this cohort of women actually changed by 22, plus 22%, increased by 22% instead of shrinking by 3% between the time they were born up to the age of 40, purely through migration. So you can also think of this concept of replacement migration as of including people who are born in different countries already to the computation of uh, population replacement, at least up until a certain age. And uh, we did some analyses uh, trying to create a new indicator which we called overall <coughs> replacement ratios at different ages with Chris Wilson, Lee Williamson and Paul, Paul Boyle some years back. Now, to show you how population replacement rate changes when we use this indicator uh, by age 30, so when women reach primary productive ages, for Switzerland for instance, instead of having net reproduction rate around 0.75 for the cohorts born in the mid 70s, we get something between 1 and 1.1. So actually combined fertility and migration above replacement level. For Bulgaria we get the opposite effect because Bulgaria is losing people throughout migration. So there the overall replacement ratio is below 1 for these cohorts and is lower than the conventional net reproduction rate. So we have also Europe divided in between two different regimes in this respect. And then we can think what's the replacement level fertility using the conventional me measure of replacement. Uh, so with net reproduction rate, not surprisingly, it's somewhere around 2.07, 2.08, but taking migration into account, replacement level of fertility in Switzerland in 1975 would be around 1.3, whereas in Bulgaria it would be between 2.4 and 2.5. So very different numbers from the conventional one. And now I skip this slide, and now of course the sort of idea which comes to my mind is how does it connect with the optimal fertility computations by Wolfgang? Now what Wolfgang and Eric have done is that they did a lot of sensitivity analyses. So they look at how different assumptions behind optimal fertility computations affect the level of optimal fertility, and these are the computations for the European Union countries. And to make this story short, they clearly show that this measure is very sensitive to different retirement scenarios, whether gains in life expectancy are translated only into the gains in working life, then optimal fertility is lower, or whether they are purely translated into prolonged retirement, then optimal fertility is higher. It's even more sensitive to the kind of pension scheme the country has. So the lower is the pension contribution uh, as a percentage of your salary, the lower the optimal fertility. And of course, it's sensitive to the cost of education. The higher the cost of education, the lower the optimal fertility. And finally, if they bring environmental considerations in and factor in emissions, well, it's a no-brainer. Uh, the more weight you give to the emissions, uh, the lower the optimal fertility rate. Now trying to combine uh, their ideas of optimal fertility and our computations of population replacement with the presence of migration and uh, ignoring the issues of identity or concerns about identity. So, so we, we somehow assume that migrants 
uh, can perfectly replace the native population and we don't consider until, until what extent or when migration really becomes problematic. And also using assumptions that migrants have the same education distribution as local populations, uh, one can make different scenarios of what would be optimal fertility in the presence of migration in different countries. And again, Europe is very, very diverse. Uh, maybe to save time, I don't look at the alternative scenarios uh, taking into account slower rise in retirement age, lower pension rate, or emission rate, and just look at the baseline computations in Wolfgang's and Eric's optimal fertility for the EU, combine that with the presence of migration, and we have countries like Switzerland, where the optimal fertility would go down to 1.2, or Luxembourg, where it would be below 1. On the other side, we have Bulgaria, where it would be just at the replacement, conventional replacement level. And this is the same thing in a picture also showing the variety of uh, different ranges of these estimates, taking different assumptions into account. So Europe is very diverse, but these computations are clearly well below conventional replacement. And migration has a strong effect in most of these countries. The critical issues are that, of course, uh, as I discussed, optimal fertility is very sensitive to different assumptions. And perhaps in the future, it would be good to try to account more precisely for the actual rates of education-specific employment by age and differential life expectancy by education. But overall, uh, I think this exercise showed quite nicely uh, that this focus on replacement level fertility being somewhere around 2.1 uh, should be challenged more often and, and it's really one of the great Wolfgang's contribution that, that he contributes to, to challenging this concept, especially at the times when many governments in their policy programs and uh, in, their, in their thinking are still very closely focused on thinking that fertility should increase somewhere close to two kids per woman and that our country needs such a level of fertility to survive in the long term and to prosper in the future. So this obsession is still there and uh, clearly Wolfgang's contributions uh, are very valuable in this context. <laughs> so we have, you know, 60s is, is the new 50s, so what about fertility rates? Is there a new fertility paradigm? Is this 1.8 becoming the new 2.1? Well, let's see in the future. Happy 50s birthday, Wolfgang. And uh, keep exploring all the things that other researchers do not dare to address. Thank you very much.